Welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a moment. I'll direct your attention over to the chat where Matthew Ketchum has been putting the attendance pre-survey in there. Welcome. All right, everyone, welcome. I'm Scott Nunes. Super excited to have you here today for today's webinar on student choice with myself and Matthew Ketchum. Uh, your two ed tech coaches for Modesto City Schools. I'm going to go ahead and give you two more minutes to fill out the attendance pre survey that is in the chat, if you'd so kindly do that. We'd really appreciate it. All right, everyone, looks like we're ready to start. If you haven't yet filled out that attendance pre-survey in the chat, please do so now. I'm going to go ahead and be moving forward. As I can tell, you're all pros. Many of you have your webcams turned off. There's no noise in the background and I can see that you're muted. Thank you so much for being prepared and doing that. It really does help. It prevents any interruptions and um, helps a, a linear flow be possible for this presentation. So I want to be as respectful of your time as I can and um, appreciate the mutual respect. Uh, some key housekeeping things, uh, just if you're not sure about the webcam and the mic and the chat box, this number one right here, this is where you can toggle your webcam on and off. When it has the line going through it, it means it's off. And then same goes for the mic button right here. So you want to make sure this button currently has a line going through it. Lastly, the chat box right here. So this is where you can pose any questions and Matthew Ketchum will bring those to my attention while I'm presenting and vice versa. When he does his section, I'll be monitoring the chat. So please place any issues or questions you have in that chat, like if a video link doesn't work, uh, something like that. And for these links, the attendance pre-survey, this one's still in the chat. 
and at the end we'll have a post survey as well so keep your eyes open for those and here's the bit.ly link to the presentation bit.ly backslash student choice webinar and later we'll be posting this link in the chat as well so i'm your host currently scott nunes the district's technology coach technically i don't start until next school year but with everything going on we kind of jump started things and it's great for me i get a taste of what's to come um before next fall. So it's a treat for me. I'm currently an ELA teacher over at Enox and I love it, but I wanted to expand my horizons and have a greater influence. And I really do love educational technology. And so it's swung my career in this direction. I'm formerly a graphic designer. And so it really melts quite nicely. And then we have Matthew Ketchum, your neighborhood friendly tech coach. And uh, you could follow us on Twitter and snag our emails in there if you have any questions. So here's a quick rundown of what you're going to learn today. Um, can you guys hear me OK? I'm seeing something in the chat. Can you hear me, Matthew? Yeah, I can hear you. Um... Uh, I'll message uh, the participant. Oh, okay. Sorry. All right. Sorry. Got distracted there. Um, so we're going to cover what a student choice activity is, what a PBL is, or a project-based learning assignment, uh, let you know where to start, how to align your content and standards properly when doing something like this, we're going to stress the importance of having clear expectations and the importance of evaluating whatever you get with rubrics. We're also going to explore choice boards and hyperdocs, which are really cool. Uh, that's my favorite part. And then we're going to give you some ideas for distance learning as well as ideas to use in the classroom. Uh, and at the end, we're going to give you time to develop some of these documents as an educator using templates with Google Docs and slides. Okay, at this moment, I'm gonna go ahead and give you a couple of minutes. I'm gonna put a link to this video in the chat. Ignore that image. Oh, okay, I stopped it, great. Sorry, I, <laughs> um, I tried to grab a, a video link and it didn't work right away. So I'm going to grab it right now and paste that in the chat and give you a couple minutes to take a look at that. Oh, thank you, Matthew. And as you're navigating over real quick, um, this is kind of the end goal. This is why we should do PBL and focus on student choice it's to get those key outcomes. And this guy, uh, John Spencer, along with AJ Giuliani are just great authors uh, who were kind of at the forefront of this PBL movement.
All right, thank you. If you didn't get a chance to finish the video, go ahead and please watch it on your own time. Remember, we'll give you a link in the chat box later on. So PBL, also known as project-based learning. Here are some key elements. Uh, the best place to start with a project-based learning assignment is having a driving question or a challenge. This can also be a standard that you're trying to hit. And you want to touch on that standard in a unique and relational way, relating the content to the real world. PBL is great for that. And so all along the way, while you're working on this project, big or small, you're giving many opportunities for feedback and revision. You're amplifying student voice and making choice available. You're tying in 21 first century skills. A lot of those soft skills, things like answering emails, how to properly address somebody, how to use technology, how to log in and out, a lot of these basic things. But yet you're also driving in query and innovation and you're presenting the information that students need to know in a fun and creative way. So where to start with student choice? Um, I always say start small. So I tend to have these big lofty ideas and I have to check myself before I wreck myself and go with something small. If you try and tackle a, an assignment like this and you make it too big and exhaustive, uh, you're gonna exhaust yourself and your students and their parents as well. So start small, uh, having just an A or B option, maybe even a C option is where I recommend starting. So um, going to my strengths, ELA, I would say this would be a, let's say it's a character analysis assignment I'm giving. It could be as simple as, okay, you can either uh, do, this analysis in the form of a podcast on Juliet or on Romeo. Just starting there with something really simple and then have a guiding rubric of what a proper podcast would look like is a great start. Okay, the key to a successful PBL and student choice is shifty, shifting the heavy lifting to the students. So it's not that we get to sit back and relax. Our roles shift too. So they do the heavy lifting in terms of the cognitive thinking, the processing, the planning, but we're there as their guide. We're giving them the skills and tools that they need. And I really recommend following uh, UDL, the backwards design method, and uh, using the PSYOP method when doing your EDI or your explicit direct instruction, uh, letting the kiddos know what you're doing and what they're going to be doing and have a model for them. That's really important a model for them to follow. So follow the, the gradual release of I do uh, being the teacher. Uh, we do, you're doing everything collectively as a class. And then you do where they get their independent practice and complete the assignment. Okay, and the first part of this is to come up with an idea. What do you want to do? So you have your standard and what do you want that end product to look like? Then you need to produce it and have the kids produce it in their own way and then scale it up. So maybe you start with one standard with two options and then maybe the next time you do three options and after doing this a few times, Maybe you include two standards and it goes from there and you'll learn as you're going along. The first few may be a little tricky. Uh, at times it takes some practice, just like anything. Uh, think back to Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers. He says it takes 10,000 hours to master something. I'll tell you, it doesn't quite take 10,000 hours to master something like PBL, but uh, to illustrate my point, it does take some time and you have to be willing to take some risks. It is an outside the box 
kind of approach, whereas a worksheet is kind of cut and dry. There's a little gray area here, and that's where uh, the rubric comes in. You really need a rubric to not only give proper feedback and to increase student expectations, but to clearly illustrate what your expectations are so that you can hold students accountable to the same things. Okay, so as I said before, um, I'm an ELA, ELA teacher, so I follow the Common Core State standard standards for my content. So whatever your content area is, find those standards, start with one or two, but then you can go on to add in more. You can even go a little cross-curricular, and I've done that with social science. Okay, and here's a glimpse at some of the data. You may or may not have been privy to some of the training we got a couple years ago on John Hattie's visible learning. Uh, but this shows that collective teacher efficacy and student expectations and student efficacy are up in the top five um, things we can influence as teachers that bring out positive outcomes. So what these numbers mean and dictate are growth in a year's time. And so anything above this 0.4 marker represents over a year's growth. So right here is one year's growth in terms of student learning, and then it goes up. So if we're looking at a 1.57, this ends up being about three years of growth in one year. And then there are other things like homework. This is particularly at the elementary level. If you do it properly and uh, do it well, linked up with some other things, it's actually a 0.67. So done in the right way, it's quite good. Um, but just by itself, just giving out worksheets, just giving out assignments, kind of busy work, uh, handing out just packets, um, you're going to end up in this lower range right here. So uh, when I started doing this, I really focused on teacher clarity. It's really important to be clear, especially when doing something new like this so that students can follow. I highly recommend informing the parents. A great time for this is like student conferences, back to school nights. But I would say you're going to really get your value if you contact all of the parents. So I've done this in a variety of ways. It's been rec recommended to me by Alice Killer that I call every parent. I didn't do that, but during this time of the coronavirus pandemic, I did call a bunch of my students to make contact. And those that I contacted, I just got the max out of them and got so much clarification on what I was doing from the parents like they understood they got it they were able to better support their students and i can see the benefits now if i were staying another year in the classroom i would definitely call all of the parents uh, when doing a bigger project so i have a big one that i do third quarter i call it the 2020 project because we spend 20 percent of our time on it and it's worth 20 percent of their quarter three grade not their um semester grade, but quarter three. And so, you know, there is some weight to it. And I want them to really understand what's going on. That would be the perfect time to call. If you're just doing a, a quick ABC thing, that's fine. Or um, maybe even a choice board, you're probably fine not calling. But if you're doing something a little more extensive, like a genius hour project or 20 time project, uh, a call would go a really long way. So what is the perfect choice project? It's something that hits different modalities, has different aspects. So audio, visual elements, maybe brings in some tech, hits multiple standards, has a rubric or a universal grading method. The Teach Better team, you can find them at teachbetterteam.com. Uh, they have this great grid method, which is awesome. They've really been cranking that out during this pandemic. 
Uh, it's something that can also be cross-curricular or also hit on some industry standards. I did in uh, two different internships through SPY, and I got a lot of information from our business community, a bunch of soft skills that they wanted to see, and I embedded those into my projects so that students will not only uh, be ready to write properly and think analytically, but be able to compete in the 21 or 21st century. And lastly, should have options embedded for a variety of depth of knowledge questions. So that goes back to that driving question or challenge. You need that in order to produce a cohesive project or board if you're doing like a choice board. And what's great about this is it, it should be something that is low floor, high ceiling in terms of ability. So should have a variety of options in there, but it doesn't need to be limitless either. Okay, sometimes too many options can be overwhelming for some students. So giving them ideas of what they can do really goes a long way. For example, uh, my 2020 project, I do have it be open-ended for the most part. There are some constructs in there which limit students slightly. However, I have a list of options for them to choose from if they're the type of student that gets overwhelmed and has trouble choosing. And uh, the first half of the year before I do all this, I do a lot of relationship building and I know my students pretty well by that time and I can help steer them in a direction that they'll be able to navigate properly. Now talking about rubrics, I have some examples here so I'm not gonna click on these links. These will be here though for you to check out on your own. Uh, Catlin Tucker, she's a prolific author. I think she has four or five books out now by Corwin Press on blended learning. She's a great resource very generous person. I've had the privilege of meeting her a couple times in real life at conferences and she's amazing. And she was gracious enough to be a guest on my podcast that I co-host with Matthew. And she has a great two to three point rubric here, which I've linked. Another prolific educator, Jennifer Gonzalez, has a very um, trending one point rubric. So on social media, on uh, Instagram and Twitter. I see this come up quite often, her one point rubric. This would be a great one to start with. And then here's my attempt at a one point rubric based on Jennifer's. And then this one's a little bit older. Uh, you could see kind of where I started. I started with a big bold rubric and I've really uh, cut it down since then. So if you want to see kind of a non-example, this is a multiple summative one. You still can do these things, but what I'd really recommend changing and what I changed for this year particularly is that student expectations part. What does this standard look like? It's not about just giving the standard. You have to put it in student-friendly language for them and their parents to understand clearly so that they know when they've met that goal. That's a key piece when doing any kind of project. You know, your project should have this. Maybe if you're doing a board game, which is super fun, that's usually my end of the year assignment is doing a board game instead of doing a test. Uh, they let me know that they understood the novel through a board game when we work on it for a few weeks. And it could be like you have to have game pieces or game cards, you know, and that's a check. If you have that, okay you've attained mastery in there. If you have 25 questions that, um, you know, focus on these topics, you're good. And that's a quick little uh, check for mastery. And then it makes it so easy to grade and you're given feedback throughout the whole process, which is nice. And it lets students and parents know where their student is at so that they can help guide them and check in if they need additional help. So don't be afraid to start small. Start by offering one to three options. Have a simple one to three point rubric. Encourage creativity. Model it for students. Give yourself some grace. Offer feedback. Give them some grace as well. Have it be low risk, especially when starting out. And lastly, have it be formative. So don't have it be summative like, an end of the term 
kind of assignment, especially when starting out. So I have used this uh, summatively, but that takes a lot of practice. I would say that's definitely more advanced after you've been doing this for probably a year or two. Uh, I would dip into uh, doing it summatively at the secondary level where we have bigger exams, essays, multiple choice questions. This is a great alternative once you get a feel for it because you can still measure the same things, but you won't have a dependency on the devices. And then you're not stuck grading essays and multiple choice questions over summer break or rushing uh, at the end of the term to grade everything because you pretty much already know what that grade's going to be due to all of your exposure to the assignment and all the feedback you've given. And that can also be part of your rubric. I include that on my rubrics. Did students incorporate my feedback? Didn't they incorporate peer feedback? So never give up. Patient endurance does attain all things. So if you want something bad enough, and you're willing to stick it out, it will happen. It may be a little rough in the beginning. Maybe not. For me, it wasn't that rough. But there were little bumps that were unexpected, and I learned from those. So be ready to learn. Your student population may be different than mine. They may respond differently, and you're going to have to adjust. Sometimes on the fly, maybe you didn't realize you weren't as clear as you thought on your rubric, and you have to make adjustments and uh, just kind of give yourself and the students some grace and have some built-in safeguards to help prevent that and offer traditional alternatives. I've had students or parents who were just um, completely against it. And so for them, I've never had one really take the traditional alternatives, but I have those available. And the fact that I had those available really helped calm the student, help calm the parent knowing, okay, I can do a traditional paper and pencil essay or assignment. And then this link right here is super cool. Um, I got this from a conference a couple years ago um, through Schoology and Denise Shovlin here and Christy Burke have given us 31 different anti-worksheet ideas. It doesn't mean um, you can't ever use a worksheet, but these are ways to stump uh, just a stereotypical worksheet that has a single answer that is Googleable, And these are more skill-based ideas. So it's really targeting the standards through skills and giving you some different fun ways to do that with student choice. And here are some sample projects for you to view on your own time. So I have my 2020 project here. I have a poster project. I really like this one. This one's a lot of fun. And this year, I updated it by including QR codes. I had students do interviews, and we put those interviews um, onto the poster with a QR code using Flipgrid. And this is a really neat one that inspired me. It's a 3D printing design challenge from a couple of educators out of Pennsylvania, Ben Smith and Jared Mater. And this is a simple choice board. And this Google tour activity is really fun. I like that one. Uh, Scott, um, we have a couple of questions. When you were sharing out the rubrics, yes. Uh, how do the attendees today in the webinar have access to those rubrics? So what I can do when we transition, I can put a link to the presentation in the chat and you'll have access to those rubrics. You'll just need to click on them. So on the slide itself, whenever you see a on, link. Correct. Then you those just links click on that link. will get you to those templates. And then there was a question you shared out, I think, you mentioned it was the grid method from the Teach Better yes. team. And then I think there was a couple of questions where if you could share that link of that resource out too. Okay, Maybe I, can in our do, chat. I can do that right now. So I'll put that link. And I wanted to um, uh, back up to that other question. If you want additional rubrics for like let's say those don't work or you want even more ideas, pblworks.com, which I'll also put in the chat, is a great resource for rubrics. 
Oh, look at you. <laughs> Somebody already put that in there. <laughs> you beat me to it. I know that's uh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think that's it. Any other questions? Those are great yeah. questions, by the way. Um, you shared about Genius Hour and 20 time type projects. Do you want to just share a little bit more what, what is a Genius Hour or the 20 time type projects? Yeah, I would love to. I'm really excited about Genius Hour 20 time projects. And they're different names for essentially the same thing. And so these came about from uh, industry professionals, places like 3M, Google. And what they did for their employees was they gave them back 20% of their work time. And they just allowed them to play, create, innovate. And out of that, so they had to work, but they got to work on whatever they wanted related to their field. Uh, and that's how we ended up with Post-it notes from 3M was through um, that Genius Hour activity that they did. And then also we ended up with Gmail, which I use all the time personally. Uh, I know professionally we use our, our Outlook, but um, I use Gmail for everything else. And I really like that product. They've really made it super cool. And I love how it filters out all the junk. So kudos to Google for that one. And um, a 20 time project is the same thing. It's just essentially you're spending 20% of your time on it. It's it's another name. And Laura Randazzo on Teachers Pay Teachers has some free resources uh, on how to do that. And she has some videos on YouTube. I'll find that Teachers Pay Teachers free resource and I'll throw that in the chat. Perfect. Thank you, Scott. And I, I think you're up, Matthew, right? Yes, that sounds good. Um, okay, I'll share oh, sharing. My okay. Sounds good. <laughs> Thank you. All right, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I, this is Matthew Ketchum, your neighborhood friendly technology coach. And Scott is now moderator in the chat, um, providing some resources as we speak. So I feel like I'm the candy store at this point in the webinar. Uh, so you heard a lot of the, the why and the vision of student choice and project-based learning. And now I have some templates that you can use that are ready to go uh, that you can get started. So we're gonna first look at this idea of these choice boards and uh, have a couple of templates and ideas on how to use these. So the first thing is these choice boards, they give the students a choice of choosing a learning activity uh, that still matches a learning goal you have in the classroom for all students. You can use a variety of tech tools with these. So most of the templates you're going to see today are using Google Docs and Google Slides, which we already have available. And they're pretty much pre-made. You just got to change them up a bit, what I share with you. Uh, the neat thing about these choice boards, they're going to be able to be uh, student projects that can be creative with and you're reaching different modalities and different students and you're kind of going back to that video that we saw at the beginning kind of when you get to excite a student on something they're interested in uh, that they're passionate about that's where some really meaningful learning can take place so one of the choice boards that we have uh, to share with you the first one is called a tic-tac-toe choice board and this pretty much students will have three choices of activities that they would do on the board. Just like tic-tac-toe, they can choose those three choices going diagonal, going vertical up and down, or going horizontal in a row. Um, and 
the really neat thing is that you can give different areas of the tic-tac-toe board different meanings. So as you can see in this sample, the blue ones are a little bit more creative. Um, and then the yellow ones could be a different type of modality that you're reaching. The center can be used for as a non-negotiable that everyone has to do it, or that you can have the students even choose what they would like to do with teacher uh, guidance and uh, permission for what that center square could be. Uh, but again, you can use the different colors for different types of activities uh, that you would like. So let me show you the template of how this would look. So here's a template. This is one that I used in my own class. I This year I had the opportunity to teach a zero period at Enox High School for computer science. And I wanted to use one of these choice boards for students to show me their understanding of our first unit of human computer interaction. So I took the opportunity to use the blue shaded area as more of a creative outlet for showcasing understanding. I use the yellow shaded areas more as a writing type of activity. Um, so they had to do like a redefinition or make up five quiz questions or reflect back in the journals that we were using. Um, so those were those types of activities. I use the center square as a non-negotiable. So I wanted all students to be able to listen to that audio podcast recording uh, and reflect on that. Uh, with that activity. So this is one example of a tic-tac-toe board and it's giving students opportunities to choose based on their interests, uh, but you're still having that end learning goal that you're wanting for your class with these choice boards. Uh, I included a couple of different links here. You can get to the template. Uh, you can get to one for ELA class. I'm sorry about my presentation it keeps advancing quickly on me. <laughs> um, there's a sample even for teachers to learn how to use the Chrome a web browser and even a multi intelligence menu uh, type of tic tac toe board. So a couple of templates, all the links here, any image that you see in the slide, you can click on and it leads to a template. The next one is called a bingo board. This one you would use kind of over time, so it might be something that takes a little longer, maybe over the quarter or a trimester or a semester uh, for students to kind of have time to do the different activities on this uh, bingo board. The sample you're seeing here is one that was used for actual teacher PD over a period of time for teachers to kind of uh, reach these different learning goals. And again, if you click on the image, it will lead to the template itself. And a lot of these templates to share some tips with you, they're gonna be in Google Docs or Google Slides. And you pretty much just come up to the very top where it says file. And if you go make a copy, then you own it. So if you click file, make a copy, it's yours to own. You can revise it, you can edit it, you can change it up. And uh, that's a great way to use these templates. So just file, make a copy, and it's yours. And you can start working with them. So that's the bingo board. Another idea, this one uses Google Slides, a little bit more fancy in the graphics here. And this is a technique where you use Google Slides and you're linking to other slides in that uh, slideshow. So maybe on slide 10, you actually have the activity. And on slide one, you're seeing these images. It's like more of a choice menu. So when students click on a graphic or a text on slide one, it actually jumps to the other slides within the slide deck for what they have to do. So this is a neat way to kind of hyperlink your slides within Google Slides. Um, so there's a template here for like a Fortnite type of example. And there's a template here for like more of a restaurant type menu. And again, these that you, you can feel free to edit. So let's say I click on the Fortnite one. And some of them might open up like this where you can just view it. And you might have a blue button in the top right hand corner that says use template. That automatically makes the copy for you. So it's kind of a neat button if you do get that. 
So when you click on these, either you'll have to do file, make a copy like I just showed, or you might see this blue button says use template and it automatically makes the copy for you, uh, which is a neat way. And so when you start to be able to edit these, then let's say slide five has like this project. They're going to do a Google draw poster. Uh, this is kind of made on here. And again, you can edit any of these. So let's say on the main menu, I wanted one of these areas to go to that. All you would have to do is click on the item, go insert link. And this is pretty cool. A lot of times you can post a web link, but if you go right here, and click slides in this presentation, I can click on slide five now where it had that instruction for the Google Draw poster. And that means if a student chose this graphic or that text right here, it would automatically jump the student to the Google Draw poster slide. It's kind of neat. It's kind of hyperlinked uh, for those different activities to choose from. The other idea is just making sure you're hitting on those four C's. So the four C's um, are communication, collaboration, critical thinking, creativity, and just making sure you have that learning goal, you have that standard, but making sure you're meeting some of these important areas of the four C's. You can actually use a four C choice board. So being very purposeful on the activities under each of those columns. So this template, as you can see, is laid out in four columns, making sure you're hitting each of those four C's and choosing different student choice activities underneath them that a student can choose to do. Uh, so they might be able to choose one from each of those columns, uh, which is another great way. And again, all of these things, you just click on the image and you got the template uh, ready to go. I did put a link here as well to shakeuplearning.com. And they have a wonderful article all about these choice boards. So you definitely gonna wanna take a look at that, including the 4Cs choice board here. Then there's the project choice board idea. And the project choice boards, they can be used more at the end of a unit, maybe at the end of a, a chapter, more as a learning investigation, uh, that you can use even almost as a student choice assessment type of project if you would like to use it in that way. And again, students get a choice on a major project, how they showcase their understanding. And as you can see, these are pretty major uh, student projects. You know, doing a TED talk, uh, try to design that presentation and record it and give it professionally like a TED talk would, making a your own animated movie, uh, building a model. So some of these uh, project choice boards, you know, making sure you're giving, you know, guidance for the students to even understand how to use those tech tools, um, as long as providing them a choice of the activity itself. And so sometimes you can even have uh, some of the student choice boards, like that tic-tac-toe board. Maybe the non-negotiable is a tutorial, how to use, uh, certain tech tools, and then they can choose their student choice project from there. And here's a couple other examples of choice boards. These are actually going to be used in an upcoming website we have coming out for students for K6, 7, 8, 9, 12. Soon we'll have this ready on the district website to share out with students and parents, but we're building a summer enrichment uh, website and this is a choice board that some of the instructional coaches created for the 912 uh, group and you can see students will be able to each of the squares here they'll be able to click and learn a little bit more dive a little deeper explore but they get to have a choice which is super important in learning and they get to choose things that might interest them uh, so again these are just templates so you can click on the image itself and the template will load up. There it goes. And then you can make an edit of these. Again, it's just file, make a copy, and it's yours. All right, besides a choice board, 
you can also create what's called a hyperdoc. A hyperdoc is a little bit more guided for the students. And so this is usually using Google. Oops, where did my presentation go? There we go. Uh, so hyperdocs is a little bit more guided. It's using Google Docs itself. And you're providing some hyperlinks or web links to resources for students to complete. This is a great activity, especially for blended learning or distance learning, where you're not always with the students, but you need to kind of guide them through the resources. So a video or an article or an online content that you're wanting students to explore. So there's major areas of a hyperdoc that you guide them in. That's exploring the content or learning goal, either the video or the reading. Having students have an opportunity to explain, apply, and reflect and share. And you'll see that in the templates that I show you. You're going to see that kind of four main guidance area of any hyperdoc. Again, that's explore, explain, apply, reflect, and share. And back in the day, for some teachers that might have done it, these things were kind of known as a web quest. They're like guided uh, structured documents for students would do online. And back in the day, they were called web quests. And I, I do remember them myself, these web quest type activities. Um, and I kind of think of HyperDocs as just more of a playlist of what you're wanting your students to learn, to understand, and what activities you want them to do with the material. So again, you can click on any of the images and they're going to load up the template for you. And then you can make a copy and work on it on your own. So this one, the teacher wanted them to look at paraphrasing themes and supporting details of fables, legends, and myths. So they provided some models. They gave them some reading. They gave them some independent application, some questions to answer uh, within this uh, hyper doc here. And then this one was for 912. This one's a little bit more robust. In this hyperdoc, they had an order here where the, where the big, thick text writing here, more bold text, was the hyperlink. And so they had structure here of what they wanted them to do, the video, the photo essay, the slideshow. They gave the student a place to take their notes. And then they came to this place where after looking at those things, they had to list three different places they would like to drive to. And they had some instructions for using Google Maps. Then they had to create a draft script of a video of making for that place. And they even gave them a model, a sample video to look at, and a little structure for creating that draft in a slide presentation. So this would be something that would be a little, this one's for 912 high school, but this would be a hyperdoc, a little bit of guidance for students to explore, apply, um, and then do an activity and then reflect on. And so this particular hyperdoc is also using a really great tool Scott and I really like called Adobe Spark. It's free. Students can create digital storytelling videos and graphics with it. Um, so they're having them make a video with Adobe Spark using their slide deck. Uh, which is pretty neat and it's all guided for the students. So hyperdocs again explore, explain, apply, share and reflect. Uh, it kind of replaces the assignments or worksheets that you might give just a little bit more guided purposeful uh, in how you're setting it up. Uh, again it's great for blended learning and distance learning. Again for students to have that guide of the video to watch, the content to read and how they can apply it and explore it and think about it. And then this is a template over to the right. You can see a hyperdoc all about animal habitats. Again, these templates, just click on the image and you can use them. A couple benefits of using the hyperdocs. Uh, you have fewer lectures on your side because it's that blended learning. Uh, that, uh, you're having the students kind of take that control of uh, really watching, reading the content, applying, reflecting, exploring it. 
uh, you can be now the guide on the side, and that's a great place to be uh, as a student takes more ownership. Again, you can reach different modalities, and you're going to see students are really doing their own work with these hyperdocs. These are going to be two really great um, resources for you on this slide. So there is a square that says samples and a square that says templates. And let me show you both of these. And these come from the official HyperDoc website. So if I go to samples right here, this is what this website will look. And they have curated and organized HyperDocs by subject area and grade level. So there is elementary, there's secondary, there's science, there's math. So you can go through these and kind of look at the different samples of HyperDocs that match these different areas, which is fantastic. The other link on that slide is the templates one. So if I click on that, these are templates just like we were sharing in our slide deck that you can click their Google Docs and you can start customizing them to match your learning goal, your lesson uh, to share out with students, which is pretty neat. This slide is just for your own enrichment, further learning to find out more. If you're really interested in HyperDocs as we are, uh, we include two different columns here, just depending on your learning style. So we have the first column all about reading articles, and then the second column are videos. So if you're a little bit more interested kind of learning uh, with a video, we have that column here as well. A little bit of choice for you, uh, what you can read or watch. I put squares at the bottom of two really great resources under each of those columns. So under read, I uh, really would recommend that cult of pedagogy, how HyperDocs can transform your teaching. And then under the watch area, there's a really good um, dedicated training just in using HyperDocs in the classroom by taking a bite out of EdTech. So those are some really great resources right here uh, that you have. Now there are additional skill sets for teachers, especially tech skills as you're probably seeing with all of these. So a couple of these resources are for you to support you in using choice for is in HyperDocs. So uh, showing you how you can actually make a template and how you can force those who click on it to make a copy, make it their own how to make those interactive Google slides that we saw with the hyperlinking, and how to create those Google Doc templates like we were looking at. Also, a couple of tools that we'll have, how you can kind of share these out and have students kind of share out what they're doing with them. Flipgrid's gonna be a great tech tool. That's a video discussion tool, but Flipgrid allows students to also upload documents. They also have a whiteboard to show their work, but they can explain the projects that they're making within Flipgrid in their own voice in a video. Also in that first column, you're seeing Schoology conferences. That's where you have live instruction with the students. So that's where you can do some of your showcasing of the choice boards or the hyperdocs, give explanation how to use them, give some modeling of what you're wanting uh, from those different projects at, you know, have that question and answer period with the students. And that's also a place that you can have a showcase. Students can also present or showcase some of the projects that they've created uh, from those choice boards or hyperdocs. In the middle column is Schoology offers you an uh, integrated Google assignment feature. That means if you have that hyperdoc or that choice board in your Google Drive, uh, you can actually use this integrated Google assignment to share out that assignment to each student uniquely. So Schoology will handle that all for you. So as long as you have that edited template and you have it ready to go for your learning lesson, learning goal for your unit or chapter, then this is a great way that you can distribute it to all your students right within Schoology. And also on the right hand side, if you're looking a little bit more for that collaborative type of idea where students are working together, then I have some information on how you can do that as well within your Schoology course. 
So practice makes perfect. It does, but practice makes permanent. You use it or lose it as they might say. So as, as you can practice and start with it, it's always a good idea. So in one moment, we're gonna get you in a practice activity uh, with actually trying out some of the templates of choice fours and hyperdocs and the resources we shared with Scott and I as your guide on the side as you develop them. But before we get there, Scott, do we have any questions that came up? Yes, we do. Uh, can you remind us what Flipgrid would offer that screencast or maybe they mean screencastify wouldn't? Yeah, so Flipgrid is a really nice way that a student can create that video and it becomes on a classroom grid. It's easy for the teacher to get to, it just hosts it in Flipgrid itself. And a teacher can choose to allow other students to see the video. They can reflect on it, they can respond on it. I do like the idea, um, we don't have a lot of tools on the student side for screen casting. So there is, you know, the Flipgrid they can explain in a video. They could use PowerPoint, PowerPoints on their device if it's not a Chromebook. So especially 712 next year could use PowerPoint for screencasting, but we don't have a lot of tools on the student side to make screencast videos. So I think in that way, um, Flipgrid really is the premier showcase video creating tool for the student side. Screencastify is great for teachers. It is not student data privacy approved yet for on the student side to install it on the student devices. Yeah, and I think Flipgrid is just a little more user friendly. Uh, and I think you could even use the screencast feature with lower grades, like elementary, I think they could get the hang of it. I have a first grader and a fourth grader, and I don't know that my first grader could do it, but my fourth grader could. Yeah, we should, I will put links in the chat. Flipgrid did just add recently screencasting within Flipgrid for students. Um, so we'll definitely put that how-to link in our chat here. And I agree with Sky. I think it's more student friendly, easier to use. Plus students are gonna be a little bit more interested to use it because it kind of mimics somewhat of their social media type of apps yes. they're already using. <laughs> so it I think has some filters in there that are are pretty nice that I use with my students and they like using it. I like using it. Uh, and I just model some of the different filters for them when I'm doing my own videos. Yeah, that's great. Oh, those are good questions. Any other ones? Um, more of a comment. Um, okay. Jessica Valerio's third grader did a flip grid for distance learning and it went well. Yeah, I think just recording the video works pretty well, even at the lower grades. And it's simple. I've, during this time of distance learning, rather than collecting a bunch of writing pieces and, you know, with the freedoms we've been given, I've maximized that. I've just been having them do Flipgrid videos and that's been great. And honestly, it's way easier for me to watch a video than grade an essay. Another reason why I like student choice takes off some of that the heavy lifting uh, with 170 students or so. Uh, I'd much rather watch 170 short videos than a hundred than read 170 essays. And I don't know if I, I think maybe we talked about this, but Scott, I I've also found that when you're giving the students a choice like this, and they're very interested and they're passionate about it they do want to do a really good quality project. And so sometimes they're doing some of their own revisions and different drafts just to make sure that their end products really well. Have you seen that as well? But sorry, I missed that. I was looking at the chat. Say that last part again. Yeah, I really have found in my own students doing these because they, they're getting a, a choice. They're very interested and passionate about what they're choosing. So the quality of product you're getting from them is pretty high. And they're even doing their own revisions and drafts of it yes. along the way uh, to get a good product out there. Yes, they, 
they won't instinctually do that on an essay. It's just about getting it done. An essay to them, even for my avid, you know, scholastic academic type student, um, an essay can be painful, but recording a video uh, is less trepidatious and uh, they'll instinctually just do revisions like, oh, this isn't good. Let me re-record or let me go back and edit it. And with Flipgrid now, they do have a little built-in trimmer, which is great. So this can be like an all-in-one editor. The only limit, and I find that it really doesn't limit for most applications, is the max you can do is 10 minutes um, in a single video. And then we have a question in the chat. How long will this presentation be available? I think I need to watch this more than once. So um, the presentation link will, will be up. That's not going to change at all. So you'll definitely have access to the resources for as long as you would like. And you can also go to file in the upper left-hand corner and then make a copy for yourself just in case something were to happen on our end and it went away. You'll always have it that way. But in terms of the video, I'm going to defer to Matthew. Are we uploading it? I know I'm recording it right now, so it'll be in the chat if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, that's a great point. And we'll post that video uh, to the Instructional Tech, the district's YouTube channel for uh, videos and they we have a webinar playlist of all recorded webinars and this one will just be added to that included list there and I agree this is a uh, a lot of uh, Scott and I are really passionate about these ideas <laughs> but this is a lot of new concepts and ideas and different ways to kind of think about activities and so Scott and I are always here as well as you just get started I like Scott's message at the beginning start small just do one maybe hyperdoc or one type of choice board. Right. the tic-tac-toe board is a good one to start with or just a hyperdoc kind of simple one and just start small kind of get comfortable get your students used to it too and the first one could be a little bit more playful not always really attached to the end learning goal it could be a little bit more just exploring this idea with them again everyone kind of practicing what this might look like and uh but we're here as guides on the side this whole time and i highly recommend that especially for a beginning of the year activity whether we're in a digital space entirely or a hybrid or in a fully physical space, you know, if the, the ban gets fully lifted and we don't have to segment segment or change anything about our classroom and everything goes back to normal, uh, you could offer choice like, Hey, share a little bit about yourself or go over the syllabus, but you have student choice in there. Maybe they have to reflect on, the syllabus and they can respond in either a written response, a discussion board, or a Flipgrid video. That would be a quick, simple choice there. Yeah, I love that, Scott, because you're getting used to the, even having a voice in the classroom already. Yeah, and then that makes it very low risk. So don't feel like it always has to be for points. I often do these choice assignments um, embedded with what's called a, <clears throat> pardon me, a digital breakout or a breakout EDU. Amber Youngman over at Johansson turned me on in this concept and I've been in love with it ever since. And it functions like an escape room where students are kind of, you know, trapped, so to speak. Not really, but, you know, metaphorically, because we can't actually lock them up in a room. <laughs> that might break some rules, but you can create that scenario, or they have to solve some clues, and that's the way I do it. And I have a bunch of lock boxes and things, but I embed a lot of student choice in there. There are different ways that they can uh, end up with the same result. So not everybody has to follow the same method to kind of quote unquote break out of the challenge. So what we're going to give you time here, so we built in time in this webinar to give you a chance to explore with still Scott and I here as guides 
Uh, so what we have are a couple of different practices. In a moment, we'll share out the slide deck again and what slides to go to in the slide deck to do your activity. So one we have is a choice is you can uh, apply to use this time to do a choice board. So on this slide that we'll share out, uh, you'll get opportunity to explore the different templates of a choice board, look at those different student choice activities that were shared out, and then start to make that copy and template and look at how you would use that for maybe a lesson or in your classroom or a learning goal. And you can start to build upon that, start to work on it, and Scott and I are here as you start to build that. The other one is if you're really interested in the hyperdocs and say, you know what, let me try my hand at that, we have a slide for that choice. And so here you would plan a lesson using the hyperdoc, the templates that we have here. So we have a template one and a template two linked here uh, that you can use to start building your own hyperdoc. Again, for maybe a learning lesson or a, a learning goal or for your content that you want students to learn. And so we'll share out the slide deck. We'll give you the slide numbers to go to for each of these choices. And then we're staying here in the Teams uh, meeting as you're working through uh, the choice that you chose, either the choice boards or the hyperdocs or additional questions along the way. So we're here for the next hour, but we want to give you time to get some hands on with these templates and ask your questions as you use them. And just in case you missed it, I did put the link to the presentation in the chat again. And then we do have a question in here. So is it choice as to how they deliver the response or the task itself? That's a great question. You want to take that one, Matthew, or you want me to take that one? Matthew's putting links in. I'll go ahead. I'll take that one. So it generally i would say it's a choice as to how they deliver the response i would say start there that would be the most basic however it can also be a choice as to how they respond to the task itself for example you could we're giving you a choice in terms of the task by letting you choose either to work on a choice board or a hyperdoc. That would be one illustration. And then we have another question here. If we want to try hyperdocs, either go to the website or go through the presentation. I would access through the presentation and then um, open up one of the templates and then start pooling some resources that you have. And I'm going to locate one that I have for ELA. Well, actually, it's not. Um, yeah, it's a hyperdoc um, slash choice board. It's kind of an advanced one, but um, it's one that I was going to share out at our site uh, and try and work on for quarter four, possibly with um, Steve Martinez and Tom Watterson. Um, that focuses on genocide. It's a pretty cool one that I really like. So I'll put that in the chat. And let Scott and I know if you uh, have any questions or would like a little bit of assistance as you work through them.
Hi, Jessica. You had a really great question. So you're looking at a hyperdoc that you found a template. And if you assign it, is it ready to track how far a student's along? So yes. Yeah, so let's say you uh, create the hyperdoc template in your Google Drive. Then you would want to use in Schoology that Google integrated assignment in Schoology that will individually assign that hyperdoc to every student. But that type of assignment lets you check on the student's progress even before they submitted it. Uh, so that you're going to really like that option uh, for assigning these hyperdocs. So you'll definitely have a way to check on their progress even before submissions. And the neat thing is you can still make comments in that Google Doc uh, right within that Schoology assignment as well to help guide the students. And I've done that too, it, it's pretty neat. So sometimes instead of circling around physically, what I'll do in the classroom is I will sit at my desk, but I won't be working on something else. What I'll be doing is going in and out of student documents and making comments and giving written feedback in there. And then that's part of my rubric when I go to grade this thing. Did you use my feedback? So I give all of this actionable feedback along the way, and they have to not only respond to the feedback, but they have to make changes based upon that feedback and justify why they made those changes. And the same would work for any kind of hyperdoc you did you could see their progress along the way and there's some really neat ones uh out there if you just google searched that and uh, i'll go ahead and i'll throw a link into a book resource um a hyperdoc handbook from the quote unquote hyperdoc girls they're all from california these authors are in education. Lisa Highfill is at the collegiate level, I believe, in higher ed, but the other two um, are in the public school system at different levels. And they're all really accessible on social media, which is great. If you have any questions, um, they're all really accessible and willing to help. And Sarah Landis was actually born in Modesto. So kind of one of our own, we can claim her a little bit, but they're in the Bay Area. Wow, Scott had no idea. She was originally from Modesto. Yeah, uh, not, not for very long though. And she was okay. born here. And then when she was six months old, uh, she moved. <laughs> oh, wow. to the Napa area. <laughs> That's cool. But yeah, yeah, this kind of hyperdoc idea is, uh, is somewhat local. Yeah, a lot of big things in education are kind of local. I think of uh, Edu Protocols, which we also have a webinar on on Thursday at the same time. Yeah, that came out from two educator educator leaders in the Fresno area. Yeah, so within a couple hours drive for us, uh, we have some really phenomenal educators and national speakers, presenters, and authors. Matthew? Go for it, Lisa. Is it okay to ask a question? Um, yes. Okay, so if, am I understanding right that uh, I made a copy of the tic-tac-toe template, for example, and then on that copy, um, are we just, we can just go in and start editing to make our changes in it? Yes, that's to, right. That's all there is to that? Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the tic-tac-toe one is the first choice board I started with, Scott. I think that's a good one to start with. Yeah, myself included. The first one I did was a tic-tac-toe choice board. And the top 
choice board that I have in that selection of five of my my examples, uh, that is a modified version of a tic-tac-toe choice board that I started out with. So uh, they're really great and it provides lots of options. So Scott also does, um, you, you call it the 20 time project? Is that what you call it in your classroom? I what? call mine the 2020 project, the 20 but it's the genius hour or the 2020 project. And I'm always excited to go visit his classroom when they're doing it because th that the students have so much of uh, choice in that one that he does because it's that 2020 idea. So they're really presenting to him different ideas of how they could present their understanding or learning of the concept. But you go in there and it's so unique. Each student's kind of working on their own ideas on it, but they could be doing a podcast. They could be making, you know, something out of wood or a 3D printer um, or an animation or even a song or music. So it's pretty interesting, the variety as long as they're kind of meeting the guidelines and the learning goal and showcasing understanding and the rubrics. But uh, I've been pretty impressed every time I come in your classroom to see that. Yeah, there are ELA elements. Uh, since it's an ELA class, they do have to um, have reading and writing involved and, and speaking in there. So every day in class, uh, like Anita Archer says in her trainings, every day we we read, we write, we speak. So we have those three elements embedded even on our 2020 project workdays, um, but that can look different. And really the idea behind it is it's going to connect them with the community. So there's also a community piece in there. It should be something that benefits the community either directly or in terms of modeling and showing how to do something. So the idea is this presentation that they give and this product that they create will live on, at least as an example for somebody else. So if somebody wanted to learn how to do a podcast, they could at least learn how to do a podcast through their example and their modeling. And this year, I had some great success. I had a female student raise over $2,400 um, that she donated to um, childhood cancer research and those um, neighboring facilities for parents where they stay while their kiddos are getting chemo. And she did that by creating a t-shirt and hoodie business using a tool like teespring.com. And she was able to generate her own designs, get them on shirts, and she didn't have to handle any of the creation of the actual shirts or hoodies or process and ship these out. Uh, the website takes care of all of that. She just got the check and then she in turn took that check and donated it to um, some homes um, for those families with ill ones, um, particularly those childhood illnesses over near UCSF and Stanford. And then I had another t uh, student last year during Teacher Appreciation Week, uh, develop teacher care packages. And she gave teacher care packages out to classified and certificated staff at her elementary, middle school, and at Enoch. So that was really neat. Yeah, I like that community piece. So that tic-tac-toe board, the blue areas that I use were more of the creative aspect. But also it had that community aspect. So, you know, creating a poster of five tips for, for protecting your data or uh, five tips for a computer buying guide or how to evaluate a website. So these were not just them showcasing their understanding of those topics, but what they created from this would also be a helpful element that the community could use as well. Yes. And that's really neat when you start getting the community involved. Uh, there were some individuals who really did reach out. There was a kid who is working with Mark Herps to see about getting an esports team over at Enox. But of course, Corona kind of threw a wrench into those plans. They're on hold right now. But uh, I mean, that's a big deal. Contacting the the DO and you know making segues there. I was really impressed. 
and he was motivated because he has a cousin that makes a living off of playing Fortnite. So I thought, hey, here you go. Here's your chance, bud. And we have a question in the chat. It um, says, you may have covered this question, but here it goes. Uh, they've saved the tic-tac-toe template to their device, and they want to know if they can now go back and use it on different projects. And the answer is yes. You would just... So what I did early on was I just had like a, a sample one and then I made copies of it and then changed it for each individual project. So I did one for Edgar Allan Poe. That's the example I have. But then I did one for Of Mice and Men. Then I did one for To Kill a Mockingbird. And I just did one for each of my units. But they were all very similar. And that's one way you can give students lots of practice with these choices is by giving them the same choices, then they become uh, very proficient with it. And then it's not, you know, this big new thing. Uh, they tend to not like new so much or new all the time. It can be overwhelming. And Scott, did you want to share, because I remember, you know, several years ago, as you got started as well, you gave a lot of different types of activity choices for the tech tools they could use. But I think you've refined that year after year. Do you want to share a little bit about that? Yeah, so <laughs> I, I've learned. So I cut back and in terms of the tech tools, I'll only provide support for certain ones. So if it's a digital graphic project i use adobe spark and matthew can correct me if i'm wrong that one for sure is approved for uh 13 and above but i don't know if it is for the younger grades can you speak to that one specifically matthew yeah i believe i'll, I'll have to check in that as well but i believe that one is okay for uh, even elementary to use. Oh, that, that is great. We have a district uh, uh, agreement with Adobe on that tool. Yeah, that's such a great tool. So I recommend you check that out. Um, the graphics are really pleasing. And uh, Jessica may or may not remember, but she got a graphic last year when I did a teacher appreciation week. Uh, choice project with that where students got to design their own graphic and then I went ahead and sent it to the teacher for them and I know she was a popular one at our site for being a teacher that the students really liked in fact the whole social science department they really have it going on over at Hinox. I'm a little envious to be honest <laughs> I'll find that and I'll, I'll throw um I collected all of them in a wakelet, which is like a padlet. It's a curation tool and I'll throw that into the chat. And so whenever I'm using any kind of digital tool, I also try and model it. It always works best, but if you're introducing something new with a choice project, just be prepared to spend more one-on-one -on -one time if you haven't um, shown the students how to use that. And I also curate a bunch of tutorial videos that either I've created or that I found on YouTube and I put those in a folder on Schoology and that saves me a lot of time. And if students need to review, I first have them find that video and review it in the tutorial folder on Schoology. I just threw in the chat some examples of that teacher appreciation project. And uh, the first one up is for um, Mrs. Valerio. And then Matthew, what slide is the tic-tac-toe template on? It is, uh, it's featured on slide 21. And then it's 
also linked on the activity slide for slide 35. So slide 21 and slide 35, you can find it. We almost need a hyperdoc to navigate the presentation, don't we? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I, I In those activity slides, I try to include the links on those end slides for those activity slides. But yes, uh, I think some hyperlinking might be good for updating the slide deck. No, it's so great. Not knocking on it at all. It's fantastic. There's so many things. We're obviously passionate about this topic, and we've both used it in different ways. And you can reach out to Scott or myself, even when you have something ready and just say, hey, what are your thoughts on this? What do you think about it? Um, or even sharing it as you're using it in your classroom. We love to hear those classroom stories as well. Classroom stories, I was thinking, Scott, that's we're at the last week of school, aren't we? <laughs> so we Right. <laughs> I was so just I... um multitasking and reading an email that came in about the plans for the week and we're seeing off our seniors on Friday and it's kind of bittersweet. I started at Enox and so I had Friday like primarily freshmen that year I had four sections of freshmen so all of those freshmen are graduating and uh, it's going to be bittersweet as I exit Enox as well I feel like all of us are graduating Okay, and we have a question in here. After we create the choice board, can we link it to assignments in Schoology? The answer is yes. And then in order to share it with either Matthew or myself, you'll have to click on, it could be a blue button, uh, could be a yellow button. Uh, it'll be a share button in the upper right hand corner. You'll hit share and then put in one of our last names or both of our last names um, and find us. So I'm Scott Noons or it'll come up as noons.sc. Make sure it doesn't go to um, Samantha Noons. She gets a lot of my stuff. <laughs> and then uh, we're, we're blessed that there's only one Ketchum that I'm aware of. So, uh, It'll be ketchum.m and then um, our monet.k12.ca.us ending.
And then in the chat, I went ahead and just placed a link to a student example from my 2020 project, the one that my student Kayla Simpson did, um, sharing out her name and can have her name on there because I got special permission to do so. Um, I felt like it was an, an exemplar example uh, to share out and um, she just amazed me. She reached out to local businesses, got all of these donations like Mountain Mike's pizzas, Starbucks gift cards, uh, flowers for all the female workers at the sites. She also got makeup kits and she sent out a bunch of letters to individuals throughout the community to get them to buy in and to help donate things and acquire things and set up meetings at every single site and arranged a ride through her parents, of course, um, to deliver these packages. And she has some great heartwarming pictures in her presentation as well. And a big thanks and kudos to all of you. Um, you know, as an educator, uh, it's no easy feat doing what we do day in, day out. And with the added challenge of distance learning, uh, I really do appreciate you chiming in today and being here with us today. Thank you for the kind comments. Um, those are great to see. Uh, yeah, Scott and I really like this idea and like to promote it more and help teachers with it. Uh, we did also add a link to the meeting chat for attendance post survey. So when you have a chance, uh, go ahead and uh, click on that link. And there's a little reflection of what you learned today and feedback on the webinar in the post survey for attendance.
Ooh, we have a question, Matthew, here in the chat. Have we come across any platform that would be useful for math distance learning, especially allowing students to show their work? Yeah, and we will put a link in here. So I would say Flipgrid does allow a student to bring up a whiteboard and they can actually uh, work out a math problem and show their work and explain their thinking behind it. That was going to be my recommendation as well. I love that you brought that up. You know, another idea, if there was some kind of uh, additional tool that they use, um, for example, my kiddo, he uses this thing called iReady. I don't know if we use that here. Um, he's in a different district. Uh, but if there are any programs that, you know, you input the math problems, you know, digitally on, online, you're showing the answer, but you want to see the work, if there's space to put the work, they can use the whiteboard. But even just seeing them put in the answers, they can screen record what they're doing and send you a little video of that. And then I like what Lisa put in the comments as well about Schoology having an interactive whiteboard also for Schoology conferences. That is great. Oh, we have Joseph Mesa here. So cool. He, he's a superstar, by the way, guys. So if you don't know Joseph, uh, you should get to know him. And Jessica commented that Flipgrid was great for her own kiddo to show math learning. I agree. It really uh, is a great all around tool. I love what they're doing and the fact that it's backed by Microsoft, this large kind of company that, you know, is not going to go away anytime soon. Um, they're just continuing to grow and acquire and they have a really good business sense. Um, so it kind of just means that their product suite and the products that they have, like the side product Flipgrid are going to be around for a while and they're going to be very adaptable. And some additional things that Flipgrid has is, has a bunch of integrations with other tools. Like if you're at the secondary level, you can integrate it with Wakelet. Also has the immersive reader, which is really neat um, for your, EL students and maybe special needs, um, or you have struggling readers. It's really good for that digitally. Yeah, and thank you, Matthew, for including the Flipgrid screen recording how-to. That's a new feature that came out fairly recently, so it's not one a lot of people are well-versed on yet. Yeah, Miles brings up a great point with dealing with advanced high school math and the amount of work that's required to complete homework or an assignment is a little tedious. Uh, you can have them submit maybe some digital pictures of the work, but then do a small little video explaining their process for some of the problems. And that could even be student choice like choose three problems to showcase your learning or you give them three and they choose one where they walk you through step-by-step step how they're doing, whatever they're doing. So if there's a deficit, you clearly can discover um, where the misstep was taken and help correct that because that that's huge. We definitely don't want to uh, ingrain any improper techniques, especially with something as crucial as math. Ooh, I love Joseph Mesa's suggestion, and I don't know why I didn't think of this. Um, using Nearpod for showing work and using the draw feature in it would be an excellent way to do a guided lesson where there'd be practice, and that 
you could also use to follow the PSYOP method, that method I mentioned earlier in the conversation where you model how something is done. You can do it collectively as a class, and then there can be a portion of independent practice, and you can have those lessons go live like at a certain time, like maybe everybody joins in at 9 a.m. or whenever you want, or it can be assigned as homework. Yeah, and what's great if everyone's on there, you can monitor all students at once. And you can do that from a distance. And then Jessica added that she isn't the best at tech, but she can do Nearpod just fine. And that it's a great tool for distance learning. And I agree. And they have so many free additional uh, templates resources, lessons on there. Now I'm not familiar with what that looks like yet on the math side, but I know for ELA, it is so extensive. And forgive me if Matthew mentioned it. Uh, he probably did, and I probably forgot already. It's getting towards the end of the day, and things are heating up quite literally in my house right now as the temp rises outside. Uh, so I'm getting kind of tired. But in the chat, we put our attendance post survey for you to fill out. If you fill that out, that's going to help us track your learning over today and really just give us a thumbs up or thumbs down on how we did today and we really appreciate it. And then Miles also added that during distance learning, having them having students take pictures and emailing them from devices, um, you know, is a little cumbersome or Schoology assessments with the typing. I agree. And I, I think that Nearpod alternative will really um, help ease some of that wasted time or seemingly wasted kind of busy time taking pictures, attaching, emailing, all of that. It'll simplify that whole process. And then you'll also get a report at the end. I love that. And then if for some reason we're doing a hybrid or including some distance learning in the fall, uh, it would be great there as well. And let's say a kiddo misses a day using a Nearpod, you can just have them go back and you give them that student code. And it may not be a live lesson, but you'll still get that report and they'll still go through the steps. And what I recommend is if you do any EDI, any explicit direct instruction, uh, just record yourself, at least your voice. You don't have to turn on your webcam and record your video necessarily like of your face, but if you record your screen, that's great. And you can do as I do and put that into a tutorial folder on Schoology so students can always go back. And that really eliminates the first five minutes of class for me or the old five minutes of class where students just ask questions, what I miss and I have to explain it, or you get a new student from a different district, you can just point them to the resources and then guide them through those resources uh, and show them how to navigate, show them which ones they need. And you're not, you know, explicitly delivering that lecture, that lesson over and over again and you're able to reinvest that time in more meaningful ways. And then Matthew added in the chat, there's an update to school G assessments, which is super cool. I'll be honest, I have not tried it yet. I've only seen it and heard it talked about, but students can now create audio or video recording as a question type now, which is so neat. That's something I wanted to see for a while. Yeah, I got to try it out. It's neat. It's now part of the list of different types of questions 
when you create your questions and assessments. So the, there's a file upload or the new audio video one. And pretty much the audio video one, you just give a little instructions and it's built right into the question where students just press record and they get to choose if they're just recording your audio or doing a video. Um, and so it's just built in the question itself. And then the file upload lets them upload a variety of different types of files from their device uh, to attach. That's so, so cool. And with the video, is that a webcam video or is it like a screencast video or no, could it be both? Yeah, it's exact same tool as if you did the audio video feature, a student would have in an assignment or the uh, discussion. So it's that same tool where it would they, the video means their webcam on their device. OK, good to know. Yeah, yeah good question. Yeah, that'd be neat, a built-in screencast with that tool. Right. Um, could, in theory, could you do a screencast through Flipgrid as a student, download it, and then upload it to Schoology? I know that's a couple extra steps, but is it possible that way? Yeah, I mean, yes, that, that you could do that. I, I would probably, as you probably would too, probably just allow it just to stay in Flipgrid. Right. Instead of adding the additional step. Yeah, yeah. that makes a but, lot of sense. But no, you could. I mean, it, it is possible. Yeah, you could download pretty much anything to upload into that Schoology question, the file upload question. I'm actually using those question types uh, kind of to share with y'all. So soon, sometime this week, um, towards maybe the end of the week, you're gonna get information for teachers to continue their PD through summer, voluntary options for self-paced Schoology courses. There'll be Nearpod courses. I know we talked about that today. If you wanna learn more this summer, there'll be Flipgrid courses. And I know we talked about that as well how to use Schoology, how to do that Google integrated assignment. All of these will be self-paced Schoology courses that you can uh, take this summer and that information is gonna be sent out. But I actually use this new assessment feature, those question types as uh, some of those course assessments to complete them for the self-paced uh, projects. So you, you'll have hands-on experience as a student if you take some of that summer PD we're gonna start to send out soon uh, with some of your assessments you take uh, to show completion of those courses.
and Matthew, uh, Jessica Valerio would like to know, can she still practice makes permanent? Always practice makes permanent. So uh, yes, yeah, so we would encourage, especially here, we're, we're presenting this at the last week of school. So they either say you use it or lose it. So I would say, yeah, start practicing, develop, explore it, continue, make some goals for yourself this summer with it uh, for building these out for next school year. Um, but yes, I would say continue the practice. Uh, you'll have definitely, like Scott said, we're going to follow up with an email soon here today mm -hmm. with the resources, including the copy of the uh, presentation. And also uh, we'll share out the link to the recorded video. And we had a request to share out our podcast. I put a link uh, to the podcast through Apple Podcasts, but you can listen on your player of choice, whether you use Stitcher or Spotify or um, Anchor. There are many different uh, players, Pocket Cast. You can listen on any of the major players. You can listen on the web as well at tntedtech.com or through that link I put in there. And uh, we've had on a lot of educators like Matt Miller, who's kind of the idea behind my Google walking tours. Uh, Matthew mentioned Casey Bell. Matt Miller has a podcast called the Google Teacher Tribe with Casey Bell. She's a prolific author and just kind of tech guru. Uh, would love to have her on our podcast at some point. We've had on Catlin Tucker, who I mentioned earlier as well, and a bunch of different ones. Uh, John Carippo and Marlena Hebern, who are the authors of Edu Protocols, which we brought up. Uh, we have not had on the HyperDocs girls, but they did tell me yes. I just need to reach out and kind of confirm a time with them and see when we can get them on. That'd be great. So um, uh, if you do check it out, do like it, please subscribe and you'll be updated to any new episodes. And the last two, Matthew and I focused on tech news, tech tools, and kind of how to do certain things like boost your Wi-Fi and some investment opportunities. Um, through trends in education, like online proctoring. And as we prepare to close a little bit, if you have any last minute questions, be sure to unmute your mic and ask us or throw it in the chat. Feel free to share out uh, any of our resources with your colleagues, that'd be great. And if you want to share out any of your HyperDocs or choice boards, we'd love to see what you've created. Uh, be sure to grab our emails, which are on the initial slides of the presentation. We'd love to hear from you. And if you have any follow-up questions after the webinar, we'd love to help you uh, get answers to those questions as well. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending today, uh, especially being newer to the position and the job. I just really appreciate the support, encouragement, and uh, I don't know if it comes through in my tone of voice and my energy, but I'm a big fan of Modesto City Schools. I really do love it. Even though I'm going to be sad leaving Enox, I'm still really happy that I'll get to see my friends and colleagues that I've made. I really feel like uh, they are like family. I not only trust them and care about them deeply, but um, they're just so fun to be around. And I'm really excited to expand my horizons and get to meet more of you and be on site. So if you see me, please give me a high five handshake when it's ex like acceptable. Not right now, of course. <laughs> but if you see me roaming through the halls of your site, and don't hesitate to email me or, you know, uh, pull me aside for tech tips. Uh, 
or tech news and I'll be more than happy to share. It's something I kind of geek out about. I love it. And thank you for the congrats in the chat. I do appreciate it. I'm really excited about this new adventure, new chapter in my life. Um, it's amazing. I'm in good hands here in our district. Scott, what was that thing that students were doing with us at the very end? It's they tapped their shoes to say that hello instead of hands. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw that on social media. I'm not quite uh, coordinated enough. I have bad <laughs> knees. I'm afraid a student would kick my my foot too hard and uh, tear my meniscus a little bit more than it's already torn. <laughs> Well, thank you, everybody. And uh, we're here to help and support, like Scott said, and just reach out to us. And we're happy to help. And uh, Scott, did you want to stop the recording and we'll end the webinar?